How's it going, everybody? What's up, Richard? Chillin', chillin'. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Going good. Just waiting for Forte to pop up, filling up the room, and get started. Dom, Richard, Peter, what's going on, guys? Kojo, Jason, what's up? What up, what up? Hey, guys. Hope you guys are enjoying your Saturday so far. Indeed. Good morning, good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you're from. Good afternoon, good morning, good night. Hey, Andrew. Good, on, good guys. afternoon, guys. Andrew, good, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, good morning. Good yourself? Doing great, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for Freddie, Ben, Sir Diablo, Richard, everyone else for attending, as well as the listeners. We appreciate you guys coming together today. Um, you know, despite marking conditions, happy to talk to everybody today. Aside from that, though, how's everybody doing? Doing great, man. Fantastic, so seeing it. Living the dream. Some dream. I'm just waiting to figure out what we're talking about. I hope someone's got a uh, schedule or something. <laughs> Forte, you take it away. I got you. All right, guys, before we start off, if everybody can give a brief introduction about themselves, uh, the audience and myself would love to hear it. Ben, you can go first. Yeah, um, seeing that I'm in the UK, so I'm the one like, um, it's about 5 p.m. here. So, um, yeah, um, to Ben from MNG, um, really happy to be here. I've been speaking to um, in many spaces and... Um, I think our first one was with Andrew, actually. The first ever spaces we had together was a year and a half ago, I think, since this spaces started. And then we just took off from there. Very happy to be here with all the speakers and listeners and um, really looking forward to this one. It must be really informative seeing speakers today. So, um, yeah, really happy to be here. What looks like Forte dropped off. R Richard, you got it, bro. You saw, saw you on mute, man. Yo, Richard Hart here. I'm a god. I called the top on the day a year and a half ago. That top call has been a profit every single day. Except one, the limp dick higher high to 69K. I gave 20, <clears throat> rather raised $27 million to charity to try and help the haters live longer so they could hate for longer. I have the world's largest diamond. I bought it with crypto. I founded a cryptocurrency that's had perfect and flawless operation for over a thousand days. The price went up 10,000 X before staking with staking, depending on how long you staked, you could be up 2 million percent, which is 20,000 X. I'm now doing the world's largest free airdrop. It had coins on Ethereum. Whether they be ERC-20s or Ethereum itself, can go play with your coins on the test net, which has been working fine for six months. Just stick the info in your uh, MetaMask, and you can go trade your coins around and have fun until mainnet's ready, which hopefully will be soon. Uh, I have $10 million in watches. I've got $3 million in cars. Um, my PP is the size of a Red Bull can. And I write free self-help books. You can download them for free. T.me forward slash. I think that's it.
that's 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 a lot of that's big dick thrown on the table. Richard, your that's your energy is going to be tough to top today. Who's going to next? I who's going to pre- introduce themselves next after that? Come on. <laughs> we appreciate you. I'm glad they started on a constant basis. It's <laughs> it's tough. To, it's tough to top. He, he just poured red That's bull down everyone, every, everyone's throat, you know. <laughs> He's energizing the room. Cool, good stuff, good stuff. Freddie, Freddie, what's up, man? Tell us what's hey, up. that's uh, – man, I, I, I hate that you picked on me because uh, that is a tough act to follow, Richard. Congratulations. I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just a guy, an entrepreneur, you know, came to this country with a suitcase and a dream with my parents. Um, been doing some great stuff in the tech space for 22 years. I'm really excited about the group here. Really excited about everybody and the opportunity to to, to sit with these like-minded folks. I'm really excited to be the the face of, of, of evolution in terms of what we're trying to do and how we evolve really bring and redirect uh, this money pipeline to the Web3 space. So thank you so much. Good stuff. Good stuff. Appreciate it. What's happening, my brother? What's up? Um, So yeah, I'm Hector Lopez. I'm a um, CEO of uh, multiple software companies in the mobile space. Um, Lifetime, probably done. Over 200 million downloads um, and um, 150 million dollars in sales. We <laughs> don't have millions of dollars in cars, but have nice cars as well, nice house, all that stuff. But <laughs> try to be more, I guess. Richard got people feeling insecure out here. Yeah, I'd rather Dang. not get into the details <laughs> of my personal, but. Hold it's on, a, it's I'm a good pulling life, up. I've that. already asked our accountants for our income statements. Hold on, everybody's sending me their income statements <laughs> right now. Yeah, I'll have an IRS, uh, IRS verified audit in about ten minutes from now, so we can do, do all the details if we'd like. <laughs> but besides that, got into got into Bitcoin. Um, learned about it 2013. Um, been, I guess, still learning about it ever since. And in the crypto space, uh, love. Seeing people have crazy beliefs and uh, hearing these BTC maxis state what they state and for the most part disagree with, uh, with the majority of opinions when it comes to crypto. That's why I'm kind of the, the, the quite contrarian when it comes to all this stuff, but excited to talk with you all. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, Jason from Everize. Everize one of the most consistent communities out here. Uh, what you got for us, brother? Hi, Tech. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jason Robinson. I'm a video and graphic artist at Everise. Our responsibilities are is making um, educational content for our community and the wider DeFi community as a whole, and um, also making NFTs and just general uh, marketing work. I don't have a colorful backstory uh, as Richard, but uh, you know, I, I, I bought Doge the day before SNL went live with Eon. There you go. That's my claim to fame. Tough. That's tough. <laughs> I didn't call the top. <laughs> oh, man, that's tough. Peter. Hey, everyone. What's up? My name is Peter Bryce. I'm the legal operations manager at Everrise. I've been a, lit- a litigator for 10 years with my practice focused mainly on litigation related to mergers and acquisitions and federal investigations. Uh, really, really grateful to be up here on this st- stage because if we don't talk about our versions and our visions and philosophies underpinning DeFi, um, we run the risk of not really disrupting anything at all. So appreciate the chance to hang out with you guys and looking forward to the discussion. Cool, cool. Appreciate that, appreciate that. King Kojo. Kaja. Hey, how's everybody doing today, man? Fantastic, man. Fantastic. Good. And, and you're, and you're great. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to be on here with you guys. A uh, wonderful group of guys. Um I'm a brick and mortar type of guy, so I own a pharmacy, hair salon, real estate, and I'm diving now into you know the metaverse, cryptocurrency, and NFT, and I'm um, I'm just learning every day. Uh, grateful to be up every day, learning new things. Um, hopefully, be a developer soon. The more I collaborate with these spaces and get to know more people, so I'm just grateful to be on this stage with you guys. Not as rich as uh, Richard yet. But I'm just here building and um, trying to spread good vibes, you know? Well, that's a lot of percents you got to catch up on. And, you know, you got to find the next biggest diamond so that you can no longer say 
he has the biggest diamond ball with and you gotta buy it with crypto too though. You know, Most so definitely. That's, Most definitely. That's key. That's key. Diablo, what's happening, my guy? What's going on, guys? I'm uh Diablo, Dustin, whatever you want to call me. Uh I'm a I'm the CEO of Wolf Solutions with a which is an automation company. Uh, I guess my my claim to fame is Top Golf. If you've ever been to a Top Golf, we've done all the automation for them worldwide. Um, hadn't got my millions in in cars and diamonds and shit yet, but I'm working on it. If you ask Tech, uh, I'm a I'm a fifth stack dev, but I, I really think I'm closer to that quarter. But we'll see. I'm here Yo. for it. I'm passionate about DeFi, and uh, I, I see a bigger vision than just the financial market for it. Awesome, awesome. All right, what are we going to how, how are we going to introduce ourselves into this? How you want to go, Dom? You go first, brother. Oh shit! I never get to go. Yeah, it's like, um, I feel like we're uh, I feel like we're just kind of fighting <laughs> up a battle at this point. All right, uh, but um, I'm an ex NFL football player, so you know I've got a lot of concussions and. You know, I forget shit from time and time again. I'm definitely the brokest one in the room. I got I got about three, almost four kids. So hopefully it's not a fourth kid coming. But three kids, and they take all my money. Um, and I'm, I literally sit on Twitter spaces and um, talk about crypto literally all day, every day, because I'm blessed to do so. But the one in the room, don't get it twisted. Dom, Dom's selling himself short there, guys. Don't believe a word he's saying. Um, myself, Dom, and Akeem, uh, we've, ho- we've, ho- we've held and hosted some of the biggest faces on Twitter, uh, three of which went over 10,000, or four of which went over 10,000. One was Shaq, one was Sheep, two is Safe Moon, and uh, that was our quote-unquote claim to fame, aside from them being in the NFL. Um, I pride myself in hosting you know, spaces like this. It's something I enjoy putting together for all those to listen and all those to come together. So once again, I appreciate you guys all for stopping by. And Tech probably has one of the biggest brains in the room. That's why I had him so I can let him introduce himself. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. I'm, I'm relatively new to the crypto space and building. Uh, I have a software tech company that has billion-dollar contracts with the uh, federal government. Um, but working with the federal government is not fun. I want to talk like Richard. You know what I'm saying? Just have your, your Red Bull can on the table and let it let it lay where it is. I lead X Mooney. Um, and I've helped develop a lot of NFT projects and, and token projects out there. Um, but I'm here, you know, to be a conduit of conversation and break it up between, you know, formality and, and, and speaking tech stuff. Um, so proud to be one of the co-hosts of Forte to, you know, start leading it. I wanted to uh, come in here and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Akeem Hunt. I'm a founder of the Soon brand, Superior Out of Nothing. Um, we all, you know, just have our adversities that we go through. And once we get through it, we grow superior to whatever adversity that we did go through. And um, I think I have CTE. So, like, if you come up here on stage and you cut a fool, I may goddamn jump through the phone and fuck you up. So, yeah, that's just me. <laughs> My fault, Keith. You don't, don't fuck me up. Forget him. <laughs> all right, Forte. I'll take us off. Richard, I got to ask. I'm sure more curious than from just myself. Uh, what, is, what is with the flexing on, on the haters? When did, when did that begin? How did that start? I mean, <clears throat> I've always kind of been this way. It's like competitive people, you know, like to keep score. And so when I started getting, like, fucking banned everywhere, like, for instance, you can't advertise crypto anywhere. It's banned. AdWords, banned. Reddit, banned. Facebook, uh, uh, you know, Google, which is AdWords banned. It's all fucked. So if you can't, if you can't advertise honest projects that would save people from scams, but the scams have no problem advertising. So margin trading, which destroys everyone's lives, gets advertised all over everything. eToro has ads on soccer stadiums and, uh, F1 cars and you name it and everyone that trades gets wrecked and it destroys their lives. They lose their money in the attempts of trying to take someone else's money from you two guys looking at a screen trying to take each other's money from each other. The only person that quote wins is a scumbag middleman that then loses your keys or loses your anonymity or you know <clears throat> so you're just destroying lives. So like trading is one of the worst things to ever happen to humans and those guys get to advertise left and right like there's no tomorrow. 
So how do I get around this disgusting, horrible censorship that's destroying lives? <clears throat> well, I've got to find side channels, out-of-band communications that uh, allow people to become aware of a superior moral hold. So, for instance, when I raised $27 million for medical research to save everyone's life, um, it didn't get any articles. got one single article in the UK. But when I bought the world's largest diamond for only $4 million, which is like seven times less, uh, it got like 100 articles. So it cost me seven times less money to buy an asset that it will appreciate. Right. To have personal flex value might get me laid, which I'm into. <laughs> evidently, um, yeah, Richard, evidently we're in society right now. You can agree to this. Most people up here probably can as well. We're in the headline society. Nobody reads past the headlines, so that's something you purchased in the diamond. Congratulations to you. That's huge. But that's more headline-worthy, obviously, in a media point, point of view than it is to raise XYZ capital for something yep. to improve the world with. Yep, 100%. Yeah. And, I'm sure and, and then, you know, it's not, it's not just the headline capital. It's also these scumbag haters that are victimizing their users like that. Am I allowed to curse on this thing, or should I oh, avoid boy. doing that? Be you, Richard. Oh. Be you. Be you. Okay. Oh. So I really want to curse. This scumbag, maggot, piece of shit, Mashinsky, that wanted to take your keys from you, told everyone, you're not smart enough to secure your own keys. You'll probably lose them, so give them to me and my company. This fucking maggot, who, of course, blocked me, because every time I would be on a show facing him directly, I'd say, you know, giving your keys to somebody else is the exact opposite of why crypto is invented. Crypto is invented to get rid of middlemen. You are a middleman. Well, that piece of shit is now uh, bankrupt. Maybe not him personally, but his company that fucked everybody is bankrupt. And in Chapter 11 bankruptcy right now. And he's just one of a long line of pieces of shit with me and got fucking, fucking annihilated. So this piece of shit from Three Hours Capital, Sue Zhu, who would post verbose word salad trash to appear more intelligent than he is on Twitter... You know, he's got more followers than me, and he also is fucking bankrupt. And so why do I live in a world where me, God Mode, the fucking God King that calls a top on the day and gives away free coins, Hex was free for Bitcoiners, gives away free coins, Pulse Chain's free for fucking Ethereum guys, every ERC-20 free copy. The guy that with free self-help books, the guy, the guy that did the 10 plus operation token, that fucking guy. Why, why don't I have the most followers in this industry? While everyone else is getting everyone fucking wrecked. Hey, do you, you remember when Binance got hacked and he said, hey, should I give away the keys to cause a chain split so that the, the miners can steal back the money from the hackers? Do, does anyone remember when Finex was hacked and now those 70,000 coins are going to get fucking dumped on the market? Does anyone, like, everyone in this industry is a piece of fucking shit. And yet I, I'm blocked by everyone. I'm blocked by Coindesk. I'm blocked by Cointelegraph. I'm blocked by the scam industrial complex that makes money on fucking people over and get destroyed so richard for what it's worth i support <laughs> you and your your opinions as well as your your ability to be extremely vocal on how you feel i think that's something that society lacks i feel like um this is just me speaking personally i feel like some of your i feel like your approach is great but sometimes the message is not conducted the right way possibly it's why me people may take you the wrong way well, well yeah, tell me. Give me specifics. Give me actionable well, it's the, it's advice. The, it's the soft society mentality. Yeah. Like Richard, Richard comes across as more like he's more confident. He's more. He knows what he's going to say. He was drawn to Hector because Hector he tells you like it is. He doesn't sugarcoat it. There's no. There's no two trophies for everybody. Well, 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 like somebody, that's, and that's how it should be. Some people actually appreciate that form of communication and. You know, being in the services business, both B two B, B two C, um, you know that you're exactly right. That temperament is is welcomed in certain circles, but then really disliked in others. And I don't really have a solution for that, like you said, Richard, because it is what it's the truth. Uh, sometimes it's called the brutal truth because that's what it is. The brutal. That's what's right just so that. funny to me. So funny to me is it's like people say that I'm outrageous, and and you're really like I just talk about software. Oh my god, the the nerdism of it, and then I also happen to have a PP, and it has a dimension that is declared. This is not actual outrage. Like I just, I don't, I don't understand what makes people so angry that like I have an accurate opinion of myself. Like I, I don't, I don't even know what the outrageous part is. Like I give like 
that's what's crazy to me is the world is so screwed up that I'm not even exactly sure what the outrageous part is. Yeah. To be honest, it's just a case of you speaking your mind, right? Like you don't skirt around the subject. You're very direct with your messaging and your language. Some people don't yeah. like that. And, um, you know, ultimately, a lot of people probably think exactly the same way as you do, especially around Three Arrows, you know, and obviously with Paczynski and what's happened with CFI and people offering attractive buzzwords and ridiculous APYs to attract vulnerable people in that are maybe new to crypto or just inexperienced with handling their own money, you know, you know essentially just preying on these people. Um, with that, and, and this is why it's really important that we have like yourself speaking out against it and being frank and open and honest about it i mean not everybody's going to like the words that you use yeah, yeah. but the, the message that you're you're conveying is certainly a noble, a noble one in my opinion I, I like when the news agencies will do an interview with me and then purposely say like we will not cover any of your products so thank you for predicting the future and all the price movements and stuff but we will definitely not mention any of the things that you've invented that specifically solve these problems but, but so it, 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 it's like, wow, that's it's amazing. So anyone else in the world could talk about my stuff, but not me. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Richard, have it, you ever been, uh, have the, you ever yeah. been uh, banned? Like, uh, what's the word tag? Ghost banned? What, what's shadow, shadow banned. Shadow shadow banned. I've, I've just been straight up banned off YouTube about four times. I'm banned on Facebook. Uh, you know, they keep unbanning me on YouTube. I never even tried to get unbanned on Facebook. I didn't care. My account's restricted from marketing on Insta. Can't can't buy ads. Um, yeah, like uh, the world is unfair. No doubt, no doubt. I'm, listen, I'm I'm partly shadow banned on Twitter because they said you can't advertise your crypto. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying though, because it's like you got the eloquent spoken that are rugging people left and right. It's like, what's wrong with the brass guy that's leading a community, right? Like, mm -hmm. people just the truth, man. But I'm realizing. I mean, is the years past you figure people would like update their worldview you know like there used to be a bch versus btc debate i was on the btc side bch is down 99 percent versus btc now i won but like does anyone go back and check the tape and be like oh god darn richard was really right and he showed him the coins in a safe way with a virtual machine so that we wouldn't get our keys hacked by a bad node and then like it just and this happens over and over again. And it's like, you know, Richard called the top on the day. And then people are like the guy that went irresponsibly long, his words, with the largest position of his life, his words, Raul Paul. I ain't never been on his channel. I told him, hey, man, ladies, liquors and leverage. That's how you're going to lose your money. That's how smart people get wrecked. I told Sailor not to get leveraged up. I told 3AC not to get leveraged up. I told Raul not to get le leveraged up. I told him the top was in. So, I just, at what point do I get the respect that I earned from being right again and again and again? And I'm not wrong. Like, what, where's the call I ever deleted? I never delete nothing. I was wrong once, uh, hoping that the, bear, the, the bull market would return from 93 down to 85. And then I called that, that it was dead and we went down to three in 2018. Richard, while, while we're speaking, would you mind giving a market sentiment on how you feel the next year and a half year will go within, within the market? If, you're, if you can, if you're comfortable doing so? I mean, I mean, the bear market would be over now, but these idiots, instead of letting the normal micro market cycle blow off top play out, they went and got leveraged up and bought another double top. So now they have to get washed out, and they delayed the market bottom by six months. Mm -hmm. So to hold the chart up, huh? <laughs> they fall more yeah, in they, their own bag. Right. They, they, they bought a double top with their entire stack, so now they're getting all liquidated and, and delayed the bear market bottom. The problem is, like, my normal 85% drop call, which I'm just calling conservatively 11K, mathematically, I think it's 10, 650. It, uh, it, it's, it could be invalidated by the Fed just increasing uh, the cost of dollars. So as the Fed increases... Outside factors, you're talking about those, those outside factors you don't see on the chart. Exactly. So, like, they don't understand. Like, when you look at a Bitcoin chart, you're looking at Bitcoin versus dollar. That means that the value of the dollar actually has its own effect on the chart. And so we've always had Bitcoin in a macro where the printing was as high as it's ever been. And the interest rates were as low as they've ever been. And the money was the cheapest it could ever be, which drove asset prices all very high. Now that they're doing monetary contraction and reducing the money supply, 
the uh, and even the you know the EU just raised its interest rate for the first time in eleven years yesterday. Point five, half yep. percent, I think. Yeah, is it fifty? It might have just been fifty basis points. Yep. It might have also been half a percent. It was one of those two. They are a hundred x different, so or ten x different. Um, so like the the issue is that your normal eighty five percent dump might go deeper because the value of the money has gotten more expensive. So, so, so basically correlated to, to interest rates, which means for the idiots that are listening that don't know what inversely correlated means, it just means that when interest rates go up because the Fed raises it, the guys that aren't elected, the guys that just, the private company called the Federal Reserve, that's a private company, when it raises the rates, um, then the stock market goes down. And when the stock market goes down, consumer spending on rich people stuff goes down. So that's the watch top. I called the top in watches as well as crypto. Are you I was saying right on that a, too. Are you saying this is a first in crypto because of, you know, the nine? This is yeah. the first time the government is that's actually. Right. Okay. Yep. That makes and sense. so now, now that money is for the first time getting more expensive relative to how where it was six months ago, you know, so lumber's down like 30%, watches are down 25%. I think Amazon's down maybe half, maybe maybe thirty, forty percent, um, and I think that even like it gave back all of its COVID gains. I think I, I didn't, I don't have the chart in front of me right now, but I, I think that's my last recollection of it. And so basically, you can get a lower than eighty-five percent target unless you have a bull run in, in Bitcoin until that thirty percent discount on grayscale Bitcoin goes away. What entity would be given the option to buy? Grayscale Bitcoin at a thirty percent discount, which is getting the same. It's like getting a fifty percent bonus. Thirty three percent discount equals fifty percent bonus. Um, and then it also trades at a premium when it does go up. Usually trades at like a twenty percent premium. And, Why and, wouldn't and, you buy at a third off and get a twenty percent premium later? Until that goes away, you're not ever getting a bull run. So, so it's let's not break, happening. Let, let's break. Okay. You've already purchased their Bitcoin, right? Yeah. So you can go essentially have influence on that without even impacting OTC markets yes. at all. Yep. So you can go buy grayscale fake encapsulated Bitcoin, which you can't redeem, but historically has traded at a premium. Um, you can go buy that for a third off and just wait till it gets its premium back on the bull. If it ever does. I mean, the, 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 uh, the exchange traded funds might, might eliminate that, uh, that premium and they're trying to become an ETF themselves. Um, I'm not exactly sure what their angle is on that. Why they want to do that as a company but they, they charge two percent a year on that so they just they they own three percent of all the bitcoin and they charge a two percent a year holding fee and then like they make 600 million dollars a year or something just like free and clear like net it's wildly 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 profitable business <clears throat> so yeah like uh until that discount goes away you're not gonna get a bull run i think these are just dead cat bounces 100%. So yay, it's yay! Like, bottom, man. well, FTX came in and bailed everybody out, but didn't really bail them out, and they're probably probably unwinding their position by like. So they got the theory on FTX kind of buying the bottom was <clears throat> they bought some lenders staked ETH at a fifteen percent discount, and then they probably dumped that stake ETH OTC but had to short to cover it, short normal spot ETH to cover it, so they pushed the price down. But once they were able to dump their staked ETH on OTC, then they had to unwind their short position. And so, like, literally, the theory is that this dead cat bounce you see here is essentially recovering the staked ETH that they bought. Sounds like a valid position to me. And then there's other open issues, like, you know, when are the Gox coins coming out? And are the Finex 70K going to be sold? Or are they going to be given back to Finex? And is Ross Ulbricht's coins going to be sold by the government? Which apparently they are. And how many of those are there? And is Sailor actually going to get, you know, how much leverage did he take on? Is he going to get right liquidated? Is he going to have to sell? Yeah. I think and this is, this is just in the top of the normal market cycle. And how many lenders have been bankrupted yet, apparently? Well, will they be? And what about KuCoin? I hear KuCoin was has huge Luna exposure. Huge. I hear they're bankrupt behind the scenes too. And then what? And if they have to like try and cover 
people's withdrawals, how much are they going to have to sell to do it? It's like, I, I just, I think there's a whole ton of leverage that still needs washed out. And I just, you know, you'll be lucky. My, my saying is 11K and pray. So if the, if the, bull, if the bear stops at 11K, be happy. But until I, I see I, that, I, until I see that premium dis, the discount disappear, you get one. I would love to hear the rest of the panel. I mean, guys, I'm not going to put this off. I'm going to put this this forth. Um, Tech and I are not going to call. We're not going to raise hands in here. You guys are welcome to speak at any point in time. Rebuttal, rebuttal to anybody as long as it's cordial and polite. If, if anybody has a different opinion aside from Richard, we're more than you know happy to hear it. I, I don't have a different opinion. I, I don't think I could ever possibly call the bottom. But, but I do wonder if like our version of DeFi, if what we're trying to achieve is a sort of efficient allocation of capital, where perhaps market participants don't have to worry so much about market cycles. Where if you join good projects and, and large large communities, that are a viable community where it's decentralized but can also efficiently allocate its resources among itself, like then maybe we can get the kind of mass adoption where we can end the sort of centralized skim that bankers and Robinhood and all the rest enjoy. Um, maybe if we can liberate ourselves from this idea that we can all call the top, call the bottom, and enjoy market cycles, and instead just try to find a way to benefit long-term adopters in DeFi rather than early adopters. Um, at least personally, we'd, we'd get closer to what my vision, my version of DeFi is optimally. So, Peter, but I, I, the problem... I, Peter, I think you're right. But, um, sorry about that. Well, <clears throat> love the insight. Definitely agree 100%. I think I have, an, I have a question too as, as well. I'll add it to yours, which is very similar. Stop this madness of the things that we continue to do over and over, just like all the different you know, tokens that come out, they follow the same strategy. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out and be the chase, the, the face of how do we, how do we, be, how do we become not only different, and I don't want to use the word different because it's just so basic, but, but I think sometimes basic and basic is what we need. And, and I feel like, like there's actions that have happened with, with all these different projects and all these, as, as Richard has said, I think there's just, how do you, how do we legitimize you know, how do we legitimize the DeFi space now with some of these new things we're talking about? Well, in my view, like one thing that we can try to improve is is all the jingoism and all the what's the next thousand X gem, what's the next 10,000 X gem. Those kinds of games are only accessible to people that find the top exit liquidity. So it's not going to be a common result for folks, no matter what kind of market you're in. Um, so to the extent we can kind of rearrange our thinking around providing sustainable goals, um, ways to better, to elevate community, ways to elevate decentralization, rather than focusing so much on number go up over time. Um, sure, bull runs are fun, and they're a lot better, you know, up is better than down. But if we find a way to create systems that are geared towards efficient allocation rather than massive redistribution, um, in my view, we'll be better off. So, so most, go ahead, Richard, most of the stuff is scams. So yeah, if yeah. you think about what cryptocurrencies is actually useful for, it's useful to censorship resistance. It's useful for removing counterparty risk. And if you think about how many things in DeFi actually remove counterparty risk, they're very few. So I'll give you an example. Um, how many DeFi, quote, DeFi projects have a single front end, and when it goes down, everyone's fucked? Everyone's fucked, yeah. Most of them. 100%. Right. So, like, I'm telling you, in Hex, there's, like, six or eight front ends, and anyone could go down, and they're all run by different dev teams on different code bases. They have nothing to do with me. They're all truly decentralized, and they were at the launch. We're fine. But and so DeFi is actually centralized bullshit. And then how many of these projects have admin keys? Right? So you've got centralized front ends, you've got admin keys, and then you've got these bridges. So billions of dollars has been lost to bridge hacks. Guess what? When I fork the Ethereum network, you don't have to bridge over because your coins are already on the other side. You can bridge if you want, but you don't have to. And so it's a more effective, better security model. You know, how many, how many of these DeFi projects require permission, permission from you to click OK? Fuck, you're clicking OK to? You have no fucking idea what you're clicking OK to at all. And how many of the like how many of these fake giveaways steal everyone's coins? Oh, get your free airdrop, you get all your coins stolen. Well, in Hex, guess what, man? You don't ever have to give permission for shit. It doesn't ask you for permission because it was designed with a better a better uh, a better design pattern 
Well, we never ask you to authorize any contract to do anything. It just uses message sender as the authorization, and then you don't have some risk that you authorize a contract. And now the fucking thing just empties your wallet. Empties your wallet. 100%. And so these 100%. bad design patterns, fake DeFi, admin key, counterparty risk-laden bullshit, and DAOs are another function of this. Uniswap had a DAO. They just decided to give like 20 or 50 million to some fucking company no one ever heard of before to do, quote, education. Then they just took the money and no one ever heard from them again. <laughs> now explain to me how the fuck that's better. So, so they, they, like, this we'll fake nail DeFi the centralized scam bullshit, it ain't helping nobody. And this, and this, it's like people to jump into shit coins and then hope to dump them quick enough to jump into some other shit coin. And then everyone gets pulled in the bag at the top. That's not innovation. That, that's just holder on holder violence. If everyone would just buy a good thing and fucking hold it, that thing would moon hard as shit and everyone would be happy. But instead, they dilute their economic energy across all these fucking scams. And then, you know, if the scammers hold their scam profits in crypto, then I guess the crypto price still goes up. But if these fuckers dump to USD, then it hurts all of crypto. And so, I mean... The so I, I, made. That are just, are just dangling carrots, right, in front of people, like with high APIs, promises of a thousand X. You know, and the centralization issue in DeFi is massive. Like, the governance of DeFi, like, my version of DeFi would be a, government, a governance that the holders would have to make decisions on changes to the, to the token, right? That's how it should be. And, like, in I DeFi, right... With that. I disagree with that. I think that I think wisdom of the mob is very poor. I think these bag holders are not capable of making technical decisions. I don't want a heart surgeon to to take the votes of the other plebs standing around him on like what he should cut next. I, I think plebs are plebs, and I don't think they should make technical decisions. Plebs are well, plebs. I certainly, I certainly think that innovation and you know technology should still be pioneered by you know the brains. You know, in the teams that are running, you know, the tokens and the projects. But I think the token as itself, when it comes to core decisions regarding the, the token and the liquidity that obviously that token comprises of, should be in direct consultation with the community, and that they should have a side, you know, help make those decisions on what happens to that liquidity and the, fu the key functions of the smart contracts. That's like, how I like that's literally a security. Like what you're describing is literally a regulated activity. The definition of the Howey test is you put money into a common pool with the expectation of profit solely from the work of others. Well, in this case, who are the others? The people that are fucking voting on how to distribute the treasury like a board of directors. This is the scammiest... They vote. The, guy, the guys that funded the fucking project and got in first in the seed round, who is usually A to Z uh, fucking Y Combinator guys, the, and like those guys then vote to just ask fuck the protocol however they want the, and, and what you end the, up the with truth, is actually truth. just a proxy for centralized ownership because the plebs are never going to outvote the vc anyway you speak in, you speak in that shit richard you are I speaking can, I, that shit i completely disagree that it, it's a pure definition of security but i do think that there's so total mismanagement and misappropriation of of liquidity in defi right at the moment and the governance of defi is really lack improvements because if we don't do it, if we don't create a framework for our own self-regulation, then then governments and you know you know agencies around the world will do it for us. That's how I feel. Yeah, I think the, the cat is out of the bag a little bit in the sense of how DeFi protocols work. Um, I think there is an appetite for people to join communities they like and accept a certain amount of centralization and a certain amount of interaction with the people at the top of that project. But unfortunately, that has led to a lot of scams as well. So the question then becomes, do we try to organize, okay, everybody drop everything and, and just buy Bitcoin and, and just buy Bitcoin and just sit there. Um, that might work in terms of immediate adoption and quick number go up. But, but I think people like innovation. They like change and they like having alternatives. The, the problem is for the time being, there are too many alternatives. And, and the question is, how do we vet them? How do we as a community decide which ones are worth pursuing and which are not? And that's uh, we have and we have perfect examples. We have perfect examples of admin key free, multiple front end having, wonderfully working protocols. Uniswap V1 worked perfectly. 
Uni perfectly. Uniswap v3.3 worked perfectly. Now, they introduced light admin keys by allowing them to activate a switch, which would activate a tax on all future additions to liquidity. They never used that, but they did stick it there. But v1 never had any admin key at all. v2 and v3 had this light admin key, but they're still, and by the way, that's only new liquidity ads. The old guys don't get you know, retroactively taxed. So Uniswap is a wonderful example of a protocol that doesn't have admin key, truly innovative, truly useful, truly open source, except again, in the case of V3, where they added a one year time lock where you couldn't actually fork the code for a year. They use a, a less permissive license. So what's another example? Hex, no admin keys. I die, so what? Everyone's got their own front ends. Everyone does their own stuff. So Those are really the only two examples I know of where it was done right. And all these other examples, I can't say whether they're done right or whether they're really just obfuscated, centralized. But all the things that really, anything that runs on Chainlink, two guys could change what their price feed is. And they did with gold. They published a bad price feed for gold. No one was ever penalized. No one was ever harmed. You don't lose any security bond. You don't lose anything. It's a joke. So, like, anything that relies on an Oracle, it's not actually DeFi. So, is Hex, is, is Hex a series of smart contracts on Ethereum, or is that its own, uh, its own block? No, it's just one, it's one single smart contract with three audits, two security audits, one economics audit. No, no it proxies. has no admin keys. No proxies, no admin keys, but you can't change it. As a matter of fact, when Vitalik started screwing us by making the S-load function cost 14 times more than when we wrote the fucking contract. Thanks, Vitalik. Good job. On top, on top of the gas fees going up. So not only did he cost, not only did he cause reading from disk to cost 14 times more, that multiplies by the gas fees. So because Hex is immutable, I had to make a fork of the entire chain to save everyone from the fees. So the only way I could try and save hexagons and save Ethereans was to make more supply because supply the blockchain, we do want to increase the supply. Let's make a higher throughput, you know, less uh, environmentally impactful fork. So it's just like BSC, but uh, with a system state injected. So like BSC is a fork of Ethereum, higher throughput, lower cost, but it didn't give you any free coins. Hex is basically BSC, but it gives you free coins and it does fee burning in the protocol. And, and so like if, if Hex were changeable, I don't know. There's really, it's already gas efficient. It does caching. It does bitwise shifts. There's, there's nothing you can do to make the contract more, more efficient that I can. Have, have you ever done any upgrade or you, you're still rolling with the OG deployment? You can't. From? There is no upgrade. You, you, it's impossible. No upgrade, no proxy. Okay, you didn't even replace, no migration. You're rolling with day one code. Exactly. The day. same way Uniswap, exactly. The same way oh. Uniswap V1 did. There's no, uh, there's no counterparty risk. There's no admin key risk. And, and it works great. I mean, listen, this is the reason we're more secure against bugs than Bitcoin is and more secure against Ethereum. So Bitcoin has had inflation bugs where anyone could mint as many free coins as they wanted twice. A bug where anyone could mint as many free coins as they wanted, but they caught it before somebody used it. XLM had the inflation bug. AVAX had the inflation bug. They were both used. Ravencoin had the inflation bug. A hacker mined 10% of the Ravencoin supply and dumped it on exchange. Definitely Hex will never have that problem that all of those other successful or rather popular coins have had because our consensus code is locked and isolated and immutable and untouchable and theirs aren't. And so theirs accidentally gets scrubbed. And so that immutability makes us more secure than even Ethereum itself. Ethereum's consensus code is not liked, locked and isolated in a contract where you can't accidentally screw with it. It's, it's touching everything else. Just like Bitcoins, they're all, it's not modular. So ours is a safe within a safe. It's actually a better security model to secure you against inflation bugs, which are the most common and harmful bugs in cryptocurrency. Tech, can you hear me? I can hear you. It went kind of yeah, silent everybody for a minute. Oh, we had cut up, but I guess we didn't cut out. Um, I would love to hear the panel's thoughts. Hector, you were giving up some uh, thumbs up and clapping hands, and Richard and Tech were talking. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions and views on, on the matter. 
Yeah, so um, for the most part, generally, I, I tend to agree with, with Richard. Um, a lot of this shit is a scam, and there's plenty of scams that people are going around trying to sell off to others, less suspecting, less technical, um, as the future, as a possibility, as an innovation, as a change. And so I think it's um, it's more so I align a lot with Richard in that sense. A lot of this shit is really just shit. Um, none of this shit works. So there's a lot of central actors. DAOs aren't really DAOs. There's a um, small group of people who are making decisions at the end of the day when doing things. Um, and I speak from experience as being part of DAOs and like seeing the inner workings of DAOs. Um, it doesn't really, you really feel like you have this like false sense of belief that you are the one that is making an impact when in reality, they just, in the facade, the discord, the, the front end, you kind of feel like, feel that way. But in reality, it's just a small number of people who are at the end of the day going, going to decide which way things are going to go and what they're going to do. And you have various examples of that happening also i don't think well, that go ahead but, but, but the, the, the the real problem and in, in the way richard phrased it was economic energy right like the reality is like we're just circulating the money that's been you know off boarded off off exchanges yeah into these into these DeFi wallets yeah and, and, you're, and, you're, and the problem with that is that you're creating this um basically you're like you're losing power in the sense of like you some, know, some. Some are losing power. No, no, but, I, but I mean, right? like in the general sense, like like crypto versus the 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 status quo of today, right? Like people like generally together are trying to like make a change in the world, like fragmented apart because um, everyone's being chasing the newest latest thing when they don't know what the newest latest thing can actually do, and they don't have an, any technical or like economic understanding of how to how to like how do we fix the problem of, of traditional finance today or traditional, um, I guess. Uh, requirement to have a third party to do things that like th that isn't the understanding and you're getting fragmented away where it's like divide and conquer instead of unite and try to do something that's going to be revolutionary in the future like bitcoin btc had that opportunity right like it, it was it was the way to do it but i caused cause this literal fragmentation which we saw with ethereum and then cascaded on to now and like that's why I believe, at least in my, in my opinion, why Richard does what he does is because he believes that someone is not taking the reins or doing it correctly. Therefore, he must step up and do it. And so, like, I, I, I you know, applaud that effort. I, you know, could disagree with his approach. But um, overall, like, I feel like he has a better understanding in that sense. And I think most people who are getting into crypto are getting into crypto for the idea of I'm going to get rich and I'm going to make money before anyone else. And I don't give a shit what it does or what it what is going before i can just dump on someone else someone else and so that, that's kind of the bad approach to take it and um richard does you know you kind of just you do uh, you know go after the idea that you will make money or you have made money when, and we can make money but i think there's there's some sort of more fruitful purpose as to why you believe that it's not just some scam pump in my opinion i think you're, you really honestly think that you're offering something that's much better and you have that you have i guess the the technical uh the technical arguments that you make are more satisfactory than I'd see in like pretty much 99% of everything else that's, that's come up in traffic. So that's just, just, that's just like what, how I view it. And, um, yeah. I, I mean, I, this, uh, this stuff software, right? They're just tools. Like people get all culty about this shit, but in reality, <clears throat> I'm not a screwdriver Phillips head maximalist. I'm not a flathead maximalist. I'm not a Torx head maximalist. If you want it's anonymity, <clears throat> yeah, man. If you, if you like anonymity, you should use Tornado Cash, because all the guys that tried to use coin mixing and coin join on uh, <clears throat> on Bitcoin got the got caught. They're all busted. You you could try and use Ethereum. No one accepts it. And a data where if you used your coins less than an hour after you got them, you weren't actually anonymous. So <clears throat> you know, and where's like so. <clears throat> let's say you want to de-risk. Let's say you want to get into a stable coin. Well, I suggest you use Ethereum because that's where the stable coins live. The majority of the stable coin liquidity. You know, if you want to trade without having counterparty risk, I suggest you're on Ethereum because that's where all the liquidity that's in automated market makers is in DEXs. You know, if, if you want to uh, buy a billion dollars and watch the price not go up, well, Bitcoin's for you because uh, <laughs> very <laughs> liquid order. That's heavy. That's heavy. Yeah, I love it. let me make I a phone it. call real quick. <laughs> so you know, and it's like so. Hex Hex's claim to fame is it monetizes time, and we know the time value of money is a thing. There's more money in time deposits than there is in printed cash. It I'm so lucky that no one else 
just took the obvious idea. Like if you're trying to take the whole analog crappy bank world and make it blockchain, well, geez, what's the most popular product at the bank? Ah, the one that pays you extra if you lock your money? Well, hell, why doesn't someone do that? I got really lucky that someone left that open. Yeah, there's still other open things like the act, like the actual peer-to-peer -peer currency thing. No one actually does that yet. We don't have a peer-to-peer -peer currency. Um, so, so I've got time deposits. Bitcoin tried to do currency, but they, they failed at it. So now they're kind of store of value. But like Ethereum does a better job of store of value. It's up 3x versus Bitcoin from the COVID dip and will be if they get their merge done and if they switch to proof of stake, negative issuance. They will burn more fees than they emit. And then with Pulse Chain, it just only burns. It burns 25% plus. It's like P1559 burn, and it's got its own internal 25% burn. So what is Bitcoin going to say about being the world's hardest money when it still inflates to pay miners to pollute the environment and dump the price, but Pulse Chain and Ethereum just become more rare because they burn more coins than they emit? So, like, it's... I, I don't know. I think Bitcoin's at the top of its S-curve. I think its gains will forever be limp. Um, I mean, it's like... Maybe it's probably limp, still better than limp, the stock limp, market. Correct, correct. Limp, limp compared to what? Because, you, you know, you, you're, you're seeing, right, like I'm seeing 100x out of Bitcoin anytime soon, right? I probably won't be alive if that, if that does happen. When, when, you, when you say that limp, what do you what, what, what do you see in your eyes? It might get to too much. Well, I mean, look, there. you just measure it. You just measure it. Every So <laughs> I got to de-educate so many people. People think inflation's bad. But they are only looking at the supply side, not the demand side. When did Bitcoin pump the hardest? When its inflation was the highest. And the highest. When did, exactly. When did Bitcoin pump the hardest? When its centralized ownership was the most centralized. When did it pump the hardest? When Satoshi, when did, when there was no liquidity. There's only one place in the world to buy it. And everyone called it a scam. And so people look at this opportunity and they're like, oh, I hate opportunity. Let's go buy the thing that's at the top of its S curve already. That already has everyone. It's already on the news, you know. So, <clears throat> the things that aren't on the news yet are where the opportunity is, in my and opinion. You got, and you got the heavy bag holders that are on an average of a hundred bucks a coin right now, right? Like you got to fight against that over time, right? Because they're going to capitalize on every top better than anyone, any anyone else. Um, I mean, look, look at the chart; it's falling over. I mean, you waited. For, you waited five years to get a 3.5x your all-time high that's trash it's trash well, like hex went up 10,000 x in two years it's like ethereum went up 14,000 x in two and a half years from from its uh crowd sale so like you know why would you hold this limp thing that drops just as hard as everything else bitcoin dropped 75 percent ethereum dropped 85 percent hex dropped 95 percent when they get back up which one do you think is going to get back up the hardest it ain't Bitcoin. But, it's too heavy. The foundation of of all the money in crypto, right? Right. It's pegged almost everything. So it's like, what is the solution, right? Like, the solution knows. is everybody sells it for better stuff to tell you the truth. Wow. There's no reason to let a bunch of bag holders dump on you forever that have an inferior product. It's just software. Use the better software. Ethereum is better than Bitcoin in every way. It gets back to that top heaviness too, though, right? Like the exchanges aren't incentivized to see this go down, right? So, so yeah, but those guys are all wrecked and bankrupt already anyway. So, like, what do, who, what do they matter? Like coin, Coinbase, right? like, like, why do I care about what these centralized scumbags think? I don't care. I want to welcome the new members of the room, new speakers. I mean, Christine, Profits, Miss Teen Crypto. You guys are more than welcome to give an introduction to yourselves. Christine, you can go first. You got it, Prophet. I didn't see you uh, unmute. Oh, what's up? I'm just saying hi and, and I'm enjoying the conversation. Um, it's actually pretty cool to hear. I've been following Richard for years and a lot of other people that look up to um, him and, and his insight. And I, I think it's on point, um, even for me being in the last... Uh, what two, two, three cy two cycles? I've been in crypto since 2014. My perspective has changed dramatically, um, only because you know, it, it, we love the tech for sure, but we still live in a world where we need to survive, and you need money. So there's no reason to hold 
like Richard just said, you know, took you three, four years to get I think that doesn't make sense when these other markets are producing such a, a bigger ROI. Um, but I'm enjoying the conversation and it's pretty productive here on this beautiful Saturday. So thank you everybody for your energy. Profits, we enjoy you coming around, always do. Uh, Christine, the missing crypto. If you guys are here, you guys are more than welcome once again to introduce yourselves. If you're not, we can get back to the conversation. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I'm enjoying the conversation as well. And sorry, Profits, I didn't hear you. I was like making coffee and then I just heard my name. I'm like, what? But um, the perspectives of uh, Bitcoin definitely fascinating. I'm bullish on both. And I tend to think that Bitcoin is more of you know, how they say it's just no one wants to spend it and Ethereum seems more transactional. So I'd want to hold both. And I think that it's, you know, productive to hold both. But um, I always hear the debate on both sides. And, you know, those that are bullish on Ethereum seem to tend to look down on Bitcoin. And I think it's funny, but I think holding both is great, but definitely enjoy the conversation. Sure. So, so R Richard went down, you know, like the certificate deposit route, right? Like you're rewarding the people who, who hold, who you know, keep their words. Say, I'm, I'm going to do this, and throughout he, he provides them 24 seven. You can withdraw at any point. Obviously, you've read the terms, you know the penalties. But one, one of the, I guess, things that you know us, us Web three DJs ends or we hear a lot is you got to bring that Web two money in, and and that Web two money into Web three. Web two is over generalized, right? Like. There's very few real Web2 money out there, right? You got the Googles and, and things of that nature. But the adoption and the growth really comes in when those pipelines of money and services and, and, and legitimized business actually starts bringing it in, right? Bringing new money in instead of circulating <laughs> the same money. Like Freddie mentioned earlier, every launch on BSC, Kronos, or Ethereum, you know, the, the, the liquidity provider bots that are listening for one of the LP pool that's opened up, they all have the same thing. They pump to these outrageous all-time highs, right? A few people FOMO in thinking it's going to go make everyone else billion dollars. If they, or, or, you know, or the, those early investors will have the technology to jump in. They cash out. Everyone's left holding the bag. And then, you know, it's it's whether, you know, you have that, that leadership and, and that technology and that funding and, and celebrity influence, right, um, to bring it back up. And very few have that. So it's like that. that's what I believe is the next phase of it so that we're not dependent on circulating the same money and hoping that a whale comes in. Um, but w what is everyone's thoughts on, you know, bringing in real, real business? Can we, can we Oh, dog, I got your answer right here. The wallet sucks shit. You can't pay nobody. You can't even do a batch payment, bro. You 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 got to have a you got to have your computer checked to make sure that the payment actually went through. Sometimes you go to send a payment on Ethereum, it says accepted. You check 15 minutes later, it lied. It got orphaned. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a thing, man. I 100% I, I agree. I think I, I think that also goes with barrier of entry, Richard. I don't know if you'd use that same word, but being being new guy to this space and really focused on you know, not having half the, the experience that you guys are talking about, but actual investments, you know, I have a, a very colorful background and that's where I'm really focused on is how do we bring in that, you know, that, that pipeline of new money, new investor, how do we bring those in? And that's, that's kind of where my mission is, is again, to your point, Richard, you know, software, software, man. I mean, you know, pick the best one, pick the one that's solid foundation. I mean, we could sit here and have a, a discussion of, you know, new tech versus old tech and, and what stable and, st and stability brings. But, you know, that that discussion around real business, and, and I'll say that carefully because, you know, the word new business is, you know, what do we do? You know, what is, you know, what is some of the things I have some ideas. Brody, I have an answer. Start. I have Go an ahead. answer really, really quickly. Miss Team Crypto, I know you walk around New York handing out cards and talking about Bitcoin. You want to relate to that really quickly and what you're doing and how you help out the space? Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Well, yeah, I go around New York City a lot. That's where I'm based. And I approach random people on the street asking them for the past two years if they know what Bitcoin is. And, you know, it's, get, it's been getting a lot better uh, with the mainstream adoption. People know about it now. 
Although I did visit Wall Street a, a few weeks ago, and none of the people on Wall Street I talked to really knew about Bitcoin, what it was, and they didn't own any. So I think adoption is getting better. But I feel like, you know, kind of backing off of what Freddie was saying, I'm a little worried about, like, you know, what mainstream adoption will look like. Because I remember when I think it was the other side or the other deeds land was going on with Board of Yacht Club. Ethereum got really congested. So I'm just worried about, like, you know, high gas fees will east 2.0 fix this i mean there was a lot of people that had failed transaction fees and what if there's the transactions going on on ethereum every day because it's just mainstream everyone's trying to use ethereum use DeFi, use dApps. like will we have that problem again or is there going to be some blockchain that maybe we're not even aware of right now that can come out and people are just like wow this is where we should build our economy like you know is it going to be on Ethereum? I just, I'm not sure about, you know, technically if it's sound enough, but I know Ethereum's definitely scaling, but you know, that other things like that other deed sell is what scares me a little bit. 100% agree. I mean, I mean, that's why you've got big businesses wanting to build on the blockchain. And if they do, they run the risk of their users having failed transactions, still having to pay like ludicrous gas, gas fees to, to actually try and, you know, to have that transaction in the first place. So I, I, think, I think people forget. I think people forget that Ethereum has half the uh, market cap Bitcoin does. That's uh, pretty close. Yeah, in my opinion, I think Bitcoin is effectively dead in the, in the sense that it's not able to generate economic activity to sustain itself. When in contrast, when you look at to Ethereum, for example, 99% of fees are paid by people who are doing things. You may not agree with what they're doing. I don't agree with what they're doing. But people are willingly able to pay and willing to pay for actions they're willing to take on the blockchain. And that is a very, very different approach than BTC, where 99% of the miners are being paid by the subsidy of the network itself. So very, very would, low amount would, of people, with roughly $300,000 worth, are actually paying to do things because would of you agree, subsidized. Would you agree that it's analogous to kind of how the different trading, you know, trading in different companies like, you know, Fidelity, Vanguard, and all of them grew up, you know, with all the different fees and play? Would you say that it's analogous to that, Richard? Anybody? Clark, can you clarify like what you mean a little bit? Just the fee, the fee aspect. You said that the fees. No, are I mean, like there's two different there's two different kinds of fees. There's fees that you want to pay, and there's fees you don't want to pay. And so basically, like <clears throat> some of the Ethereum fees, people would prefer not to pay them if they could, but they have to. Then the other question is like, what is that fee money being used for? So on Ethereum, unfortunately, you know, that fee money currently they just pollutes the environment. Now they're tr trying hard as they can, you know, <clears throat> get into proof of stake instead of proof of work. I mean, like, also, you need fees for security, right? So if Bitcoin, as the other speaker said, generates all of its revenue from block subsidies and not from fees, then no one actually has to uh, secure the network once the block reward dies enough. And so every time there's a happening, your security actually can go down a little bit because... That, sec that security subsidy was coming from inflation. And as they drop the inflation, now you just rely on fees. No one wants to actually pay the fees. Because, I mean, what can you really do with Bitcoin? You're going to send it from one address to another. You can't actually, like, do real DeFi, right? There's no NFT launches. There's no time deposits. There's no, like, any stuff that people really want. So <clears throat> I think, I think long-term, the, the fact that Ethereum is like 99% of all the fees and all blockchains is pretty good because it shows that this stuff is really valuable and people will really pay for it. I mean, I don't know. It's like some of the stuff they shouldn't pay for though. Like, I don't know, guys, the monkey pictures. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a bull in the, the monkey picture market, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you touched on something there. I mean, we, we didn't let you, you, you know, about the interactions with the wallets, all its the whole having the wait time, you know, is, is, is the pulse chain addressing that? Are you trying to redefine? Well, it's just, a, it's a fork of Ethereum. It's a fork of Ethereum with three second blocks instead of 13 second blocks. Okay. So it's a, for, for right now, you, you're essentially, you know, essentially the same thing with a Binance twist to it. Are you, you guys a proof of stake? Or well, it yeah, it's proof of stake. So, you know, we do fee burn, we use proof of stake. It has 33 validators. May end up with like 25 the moving it outside the EVM for higher throughput and putting it actually in the node itself. So it's it's kind of like 
if you're going to refactor and make stuff stronger, a bear market's a great time to do it. 100%. And another thing is, you know, Bitcoin worked good when there was no fees. When I was mining Bitcoin, there was literally no fees. You could send your transactions with no fees at all. And it worked good. So I still, I still think I like these networks more for getting rich than I do for actually computation. Guys, while we're on the topic, I would love to know from individually, all of you guys representing your own brands, what your guys' North Star is and where you guys kind of see yourself in two years. I swear to God, this will be the last time I talk for a little while. I'm going to give you guys time. Full vertical integration. Hex monetizes time. Pulse changes the consensus network. I've got a team building out a wallet to replace MetaMask. MetaMask has been fine so far, but actually they have a blacklist, and they accidentally blacklisted one of my sites one time. And I'm like, bro, what is this? Like any MetaMask user now goes to my site, says that it's blocked because they have MetaMask installed? What the fuck is this? I'm going to go lobby them on GitLab to unblock the fucking site? Like, that's not okay. So not okay. And then, you know, they kind of jack people with their fees on the, uh, they just forward their orders to 1.9 on your swap swap if you use the in-wallet swap feature. So, I mean, for redundancy and for, you know, decentralization and robustness, I think it's good to have another wallet. So if I've got the wallet, I've got the trading with PulseX, our fork of Uniswap, I've got the consensus network with Pulse Chain, and I've got the storage of value with Hex, I've got complete and total vertical integration except for fiat on-ramps and off-ramps. That's it for me. That's my game. Yeah, for us, <clears throat> Freddie with LFG, for us, it's really going to be to focus on that exponential growth outside. We've talked about utilities outside, <clears throat> redirecting, redirecting those money pipelines to be able to really create value outside of the space on real traditional, uh, real traditional investments that will, that will create that value for, for, for the token. That's really where we're headed. From, um, from my point of view at Everize, like our mission is to build tools and just build a suite of the apps and continue to, continue to focus on this security and improve and empower people with their choices through decentralization to make Web3 development faster for people looking to come into the space. And, you know, you know, and that's a real strong passion of ours across our five chains that we're currently on now and further chains in the future. I'll just add to that, Jason, since we work for the same project. Yeah, over at Everize, like, we think the reality is in 10 to 20 years, you know, decentralization to a certain extent will, course, you know, correlate and coalesce around optimal tech, but it will also want to correspond and correlate and coalesce around communities. And so these communities need to be minimally viable, but once they start forming and everybody gets their assets into self-custody, they're going to need a foundation structure. So we're proud to build that. And um, we're proud to build tools to keep people's wallets safe and secure as best we can. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I lead my own project. You know, I'm, I'm taking the mining concept and, and really trying to translate it, you know, beyond just crypto mining. Um, and, and Google, you know, they, they hit a home run with ad, with what I believe is called it's ad mining. Um, and it took them to be a billion dollar company. So that those are, those, that's the avenue I'm, or the niche I'm trying to, uh, to, to build in crypto is, is really bringing that ad revenue in and 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 do that that way it takes a long time but you know once those processes are built and, and the train is going downhill anything's possible i love that guys listeners be sure to share the space follow all the speakers up here and we appreciate you guys for stopping by we do have a new speaker uh Sagreev, if i said your name incorrectly i do i do apologize Okay. Probably right. So, so I mean, Richard, you're going to speak for the last time. We have that empty space. Um, this wallet you're designing, is this something that is going to behave like every other wallet that's out there? Are you building a layer between, you know, private keys and uh, adding a layer of security between that? What, what, you know, I mean, it's mostly like every other wallet that's out there. I mean, I care more about security than most, but, uh, you know, MetaMask kind of cares too. So I can't say that I'm building any type of real innovation there yet, but don't be surprised if you do see features like make show me all my token balances across all my addresses, actually like batch send, like stuff like that I care about. Got it. You know, best Wouldn't mind having everybody be able to claim all their free airdrops too, but it might be a vector for bad projects too. I, I got to decide on that one. 
Yeah, slip slipping a bad contract in there that approved things that it shouldn't be approving. I get it. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hector, so like, let's talk about something that you always love to talk about, right? You know, the the one megabyte limit that you know is preventing true scale. Um, and and Richard touched on it earlier. Touched on it earlier. BTC and BCH by essentially picking the side, and and here you are. Uh, a champion, and I believe you know you're a defeater of Bitcoin maxis that are just spewing the repetitive garbage that's out there, and you have this it's a system that runs on the same rails essentially, right? Um, that can do a lot more. You know, wh- what do you what are your thoughts on that? Wh- where do you see the future going? Um, because you know, humanity is all about expanding and going faster, and to have something that they're saying is, you know, written in stone, not, not going to change the value of value of bitcoin doesn't go up 10x there is no incentive for miners to keep mining and i say 10x is a you know hyperbole um so go for it man so yeah so um btc like i said has inherent flaws in it um and a lot of it stems from the transaction throughput capacity um people say it's fine that it's meant for you know, only the pristine of most pristine transactions. Well, if that's the case, then you'll never be able to have the world use it because you have a limit of 600,000 transactions per day, which if you're not willing to do every four years, then your your capacity as a miner uh, cuts in half every four years. So that means everyone must pay double as much just to maintain status quo, not to necessarily increase the quote unquote security of the network. So if that's the case, then we trend towards higher fees and if we trend towards higher fees, you price out more and more people as we go along that curve, right? So if that's the case and that's the belief, then BTC is not meant for everyone. It's meant for the, the only the, the most elite and the most rich to be able to transact on chain. And everyone else can, can screw off onto layer two. Layer two is of why you went into Bitcoin, kills the properties of the whole narrative of running your own node. And you're effectively left with nothing because it doesn't change anything you're still requiring uh, middlemen to do everything else for you so if so that to me um and btc hasn't and can't get over that hump because if even if they had high transactions high number of transactions because they're at 250 right now 250,000, um the costs are still ridiculously high they need to remove the throughput i mean increase the throughput so that doesn't happen so for me i i believe in in but BTC is a poor, poor implementation of that. And the issue that, that is, is why I look into, um, moved into BCH, then subsequently moved into BSV for the fact that it is the higher throughput capacity, which I believe leads to people to create real world applications that utilize a blockchain and that blockchain can be done and it can scale with the necessary, um, these necessary models of business models that can, can be attained using the internet, right? So. Right now, we're limited by 2.9% plus 30 cents to move value across the internet fairly easily using um, payment networks. And Bitcoin allows that to change, right? And BTC does not allow that to change. That's why my stance is I am in Bitcoin SV. And for the sole purposes, I want to see that play out. I want to see high transaction capacity play out on a proof of work chain and allow people to create business models that I think would be superior than what we've seen, which I, I know would be superior than all this DeFi crap that we're seeing today. Um, I want to see actual use cases occur and um, move into on a proof of work system rather than um, these centralized uh, light paper crap that really doesn't have anything there when you really look behind the surface. So yeah, it's pretty simple in my belief. Um, and I'm, I'm honestly, under, I understand I'm the, the outcast of the outcast. Like you might not even know what that is, but it, it does have merit. And when we, when we speak technically and try to go at like the capacity of it, it does blow everything else out of the water. I'd say in terms of as a user, I've, I've done it all. I've been part of it all. So, um, yeah, that's just, that's just my take. I'm not, I don't honestly don't, I'm not trying to sell anyone anything. I, I, thankfully I've had this over the years, but I don't, I'm not looking, you know, I don't look at this to like to try to dump it on someone else. I look at this as like, I feel like this is an innovation and a change that I want to make a bet on. That's my bet. My bet is that I believe companies can 10x their, their abilities against the status quo by having a, a scalable blockchain that will allow them to do so. And the businesses who do so will have to seek out this coin to be able to write to chain. And therefore, BSV to me is the only solution that does that today. 
stuff. It's too easy, dog. I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm going to give you a pass. <laughs> if anybody likes, anybody likes to as well, it. dive into it. Rebuttal Let's against go. Hacker. Hacker knows, Hacker is totally intelligent, knows his software, understands his stuff. I would love to hear a rebuttal to this. I mean, every single blockchain is a ghost chain except for Bitcoin and Ethereum. They just spam up the BSV chain with stupid weather feed data to try and make it look like activity. His founder is a guy that's been claiming to be Satoshi for a whole lot of years, lost a court case for $85 million, and then said, uh, hey, I won. Well, the, the thing is, the reason that $85 million, that that is going to a company that he owns 70%, and so he's really paying himself back. Isn't that always the case? Well, I don't know if that's always the case, but um, I've dealt with litigation. I, I wasn't on the other end where I was betting get my fighting against myself or how to pay myself. But um, besides that, that, that like irrelevant thing, like I, I agreed with you in the sense that when Craig Wright came out in 2015, roughly 2014, he started talking a lot of stuff. But over the years, he's able to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And we have a scalable blockchain today. You may disagree with what the content is of the what's on the blockchain, what people will use it for, but the, it doesn't and it can do whatever it wants to do. People can people have built stuff that is on Ethereum. There's even transpiler to transpile code from from Solidity to uh, Bitcoin script. So this is this is possible. This is a reality today, and you know we can argue on uh, that. How much did you lose on those two plays, the BCH and then the BSV play? Because it seems like you got reloaded, man. That's like two ninety five downs in a row. Well, no, I, I just, I got mine forked up. Oh, all right. So to me, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. And I'm, like, I'm not saying like, I'm not just some like Bitcoin guy who doesn't get into this stuff. Like I, I'm a person who like, who owns Ethereum, who's done all this stuff. Like I've been in DeFi, I've done all this stuff for years. Like it's, I don't speak from, the, from like a naive perspective. I just, I've been in Bitcoin and I've held Bitcoin. And I've held the forks and I understood what the forks did. And I completely agree today with you in the sense that BTC is, a, is garbage, it's dead because of these like inherent issues it has now and i agree with you that you feel that you can find a better way to fix that and i dis i just disagree that i think bitcoin still can be fixed so so one thing that that i'm i just heard is the fork concept that you're sure you're you're you fork ethereum you're rebranding it as pulse chain how is this possible right you you've been successful with hex you built up this amount this what I'm, I believe is, is uh, adequate liquidity, but when you, you, you fork something and then you bring that over, because Hex now exists on two sides, am, am I correct? It exists on Pulse Chain and it exists on Ethereum. How, is, how, how are you handling, I guess, pricing or the liquidity of something that, or how did you, can you speak to how that this is happening, that you're airdropping all of these things and you're still running the OG Hex on Ethereum what should people expect, right? And, and is it going to be volatility early, watching paper hands sell their airdrops and, and just weathering that storm because, you know, you believe in what you're doing? What does that look like? I mean, basically, <clears throat> there's 660 million sitting in the sacrifice addresses, so people believe in the political messages that kind of led to these things. And if you've got the same code and you've got liquidity and you've got a functioning consensus network, I think people want their free coins. I think they want to play with this stuff. And it's important to launch a zero for tax purposes anyway. So it's hard to dump from zero. 100%, 100%. Are you working with exchanges to have this, you know, further proliferate what you're doing in, in, in Pulse? Or are you just going to – I'd say it's a bootstrap at a different level. Um, he's going to – I mean, the only, the only exchange I know that's listening it, uh, is OKX so far. But, you know, they didn't come out public with it, so we'll see. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Jason, Jason and Peter. Everard, for a year, right? You guys have been consistent in, you know, growing your technology stack um, and, and keeping community engaged. What, what 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 do we foresee in the near future for uh, Everard? Peter, would you like to answer that? Sure. Uh, I mean, thanks for the kind words. Um, we definitely have a few focuses, and as I've mentioned before, security is, is topmost among them. So it is software, essentially, that aims to keep people secure, um, ways to revoke token approvals. Um, equally important to that is developing that community and having those conversations. 
um, in my view, again, the space is going to coalesce around certain factors over time. So if Everize itself is kind of associated with a brand of free and open conversations about best practices, that to me is almost the most exciting part of the project. You know, we host daily spaces where people can come and talk about ideas, theories, things that we can elevate to the dev team. So to me, the most exciting thing is to see the games take ownership of the direction of the project over time. Um, there's deliverables, of course, that uh, the developers and the CEO are focused on, um, including a full-scale project launchpad, um, so that we can enable people with good ideas, people of conscience, people with ethics, to come to the forefront of the space and say, look, I have an idea about how I want to organize a minimum viable community, but I don't necessarily have the tech knowledge to, uh, to participate in the space yet. So again, my view of DeFi, and that's the space, uh, you know, the title of the space, my version of DeFi is one in which communities of similar interests, similar hobbies even, similar values can coalesce um, and then have a way to efficiently allocate capital among each other. So that depends upon external solutions on bringing external value to a project. And when a community, the Everrise community, can associate with a brand, you know, the decentralized applications that are being put out, then you get into this kind of dual set where you know both sides sustain the other side. The community elevates the brand, the community spreads awareness about the project, and at the same time, the developers provide solutions that everybody can use, you know, no matter what project you're in. So people say unify DeFi a lot. I think that's fine to an extent, but I do think projects will develop over time that don't have to share the same values, but they do have to share the same security. And that's the thing that we've been talking about, these centralized exchanges, these banks that spend all of their time figuring out how to apply externalities to our transactions. Um, these are the entities that DeFi aims to combat aggressively, and Everize is proud to be a part of finding a way to allocate value in a more efficient manner. Absolutely. Uh, we look at ways and means to offer solutions to the projects. Uh, next, the app that we've got launching you know, is going to be you know, a launch pad but the launch pad is going to be across the five chains that we're on and we'll be giving out to developers the, the ways and means to with these utilities that you know are, are often quite first to market you know the ability to lock secure uh, your smart contract onto the blockchain uh, behind a community vote to make you know key decisions on function changes you know, liquidity changes obviously a community held vote for initial lp like the the custody of the initial lp that's raised you know, ever migrate, being able to migrate over to, you know, a new version of a smart contract, you know, being able to essentially have a swap um, that doesn't, you know, activate the swap. It's you know, very commonplace, actually, there's a lot of smart contracts that have that, which adds sell pressure to the chart, which is just not healthy um, for projects looking to grow and build. So, again, we identify issues problems that are plaguing DeFi, we get feedback from the community, from other developers, and we go out, we put our heads down and we build. We build solutions and we won't stop doing that. Catcoin, if you'd like to introduce yourself, you're more than welcome to. Yes, Andrew, thank you so much. Hello, guys. Hello, friends. Because uh, I consider I consider everyone on this space a friend, and uh, that's why we are here together to to bring the product uh, better for the for the changing the world in uh, in this uh, this space. So I am Akosti from uh, Romania, from Bucharest. I'm graphic designer. Uh, I spend my time with communities and. and uh, with charity uh, as well. Ukraine is happening something and uh, I help people from Ukraine as well. But uh, regarding on blockchains and bitcoins and stuff like that, I think... Uh, uh, you sell assets at a 95% dip, like, why wouldn't you just, like, buy them instead? Uh -huh. right. No, I'm just saying, right. like, I'm not saying, I'm like, we're selling crypto right now. I'm, like, saying, like, if you... if Cryptos, if you, all right, right now you have crypto in your wallet, you don't have cash, you could go spend crypto, what would you use was the question. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to hate, I'm not trying to say sell crypto. I'm just saying, like, if you're using it as money, what would you use? I mean, it doesn't matter because no one accepts any of this stuff, right? You're just going to have to use the credit card middle party and all the credit card middle parties accept a lot of coins. 
you know, right. the, for me, like it will take something massive, like you know, a company like PayPal or Amazon or something, to really have Bitcoin holdings on their balance sheet, and then literally you would have a like a split wallet. So you'd have a fiat wallet and you'd have a crypto wallet to buy assets with. I don't. It's it's right now isn't a very easy time to start looking at implementing crypto as a actual transaction as a currency when there is a you know legacy system is working and you're not paying the fees that you're paying on for, for converting crypto to fiat what we use crypto as currency like you know why why wouldn't we be looking to do that isn't this like you know like i don't understand I'm because it would, it, it, it would need it would need you know, it would need regulation and it would need big players to actually instigate that, not just the community. It would need, like, pow the powers that be would have to kind of want that to happen. What if it just becomes inevitable like it is and people just start accepting crypto like they accept cash? Yeah, I mean, if, if, people, if people are happy to pay the trans transaction costs of conversions, then, yeah, by all means, you know, people can make, make a case of that. But, it, again, you know, when we talk about adoption... People generally flock to the easiest way of purchasing goods, right, and services, and 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 I don't know if the easiest way right now is is crypto. That's really what it boils down to, Miss um, <clears throat> Teen. I've 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 looked at other different country, particularly what you're talking about, right? Because user experience, why not make it easy? Why not? But I think Richard probably Richard and Jason both hit the nail on the head. I mean, you're talking about the intent and the purpose wasn't so much to just buy data to, to transact because you need to be a bank and you need to have all these financial instruments. It's, it's you buy it and to hold to create that wealth. So yeah, I, I, I don't see it. Happening. As soon as somebody else wants to use it to buy coffees, you won't be able to afford the fees anymore. It's that easy. But what that, about, that's right. but like when there basically are no fees, it's like a center less, like John can bought a Lambo for, I guess a few hundred grand, 400 grand. And it was like a penny or less for his transaction. So, like, why wouldn't that be feasible? With Does like someone want to explain the bid auction market for the limited block space? I, it, it's probably Bitcoin used to be free, too. As soon as people start using it, you can't afford it anymore. No. It's okay. All right. We can move on, then. But I don't know. I That's what I use that's what I would prefer if I was paying for something Litecoin, you know, whether it's a dollar or whether it's a few hundred grand or millions, it's a feasible way to transact. It's quick. It's extremely cheap. So is XRP, so is XLM. So is every empty blockchain. But like Litecoin, then like wherever Bitcoin is, Litecoin is. I mean, they use coin payments to support everybody. Yeah, I think you're focused more on the ease of use versus crypto to buy stuff. I could be wrong. I mean, like, if you got if you got a seller that's willing to accept crypto, then that's that's all very well and good. I mean, you can transact very quickly with minimal fees, but it's when you're looking to kind of mix in with the actual fiat world and then start to can you know load up a card, you know, the fees associated with that. If we see like a, a great amount of people doing that cost would go up and it isn't the most efficient way of transacting at the moment i mean yeah. in terms of swapping to usd litecoin is like the fastest and cheapest to do that as i recall. still think xrp is cheaper and xlm too it is they are xm is excellent like people want to use litecoin litecoin does have the the, the trust and, and time How about Dogecoin? I think you broke up. Yeah, can we speak on, on Dogecoin real quick? Real quick, I mean, before you get get on to Dogecoin, I just wanted to point out that uh, crypto.com, like Tech said, you got to sell your crypto and convert it to USDC. At Coinbase, you set your crypto that you want your card to withdraw it from, and when you swipe it, it automatically sells it, converts it, and then processes it. Processes the um, the transaction. I think we should honor her for pointing out that. I think we should honor her for pointing out that cheaper fees are good, and that lower middleman stuff is good. And so, like as a guy starting a chain to like make everyone pay less fees, 
I support that, you know, like it, 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 less fees are nice. So, so let's talk about that with Litecoin. So you're selling an asset. Are you selling an asset when you transact in Dogecoin? And Jason, to your point, you were talking about having a, a large company or large entities, you know, to be able to uh, accept and, and propagate that economy, right? So is Tesla you know, and is that not a fork off of Litecoin? So that kind of solves your your issue with uh, selling the assets. Um, it is inflationary, uh, you know, to an extent, and that it's not a a fixed, you know, capped asset, right? No, I dare say in the future there'll be, like I said, there will be a, you know, transactions which will be side by side. You'd have the option of paying in crypto or in or in fiat. I think we'll see that more and more as this develops and as as more companies get into blockchain. blockchain. I just think at the moment it's it comes with its own challenges is what I was trying to get at. And um, it's not necessarily the most efficient way of of purchasing goods, especially when you're looking at a coffee, you know, a cup of coffee or something like that. If, if you've got a seller that wants the asset, you know, in, you know, without having to go through conversion, wants to receive Litecoin, then yeah, it's a very efficient way of, of purchasing an asset, you know, as opposed to, you know, what, what's out there at the moment. So the, the issue is that it's a function of competition. The market's for 100 years to be very competitive, competitive. Like people think that Visa and MasterCard are making an absolute killing, but in reality, I'm not sure they are. So for instance, you get, you pay 1.5% as a merchant to accept Visa or MasterCard. And what do Visa, Visa and MasterCard do? They let your customers spend more money than they actually have by lending the money. Well, that's oftentimes worth a percent. And they also make the customer feel happier to spend their money because they know that if something goes wrong, they can get their money back or they get an enhanced warranty or they get cash back back for using it. They also have, all, also have all these little side games with airline miles and other types of reward programs. When you add all that shit up, it adds up to like a percent and a half of value. And then when you pay with crypto, you get nothing. You get no cash back. You get no charge back ability to protect yourself from people screwing you. You get no side games. You get like almost nothing in return. So the vast majority of people would greatly prefer to pay for something with a Visa or MasterCard or Amex instead of crypto because it gives the person that does the purchasing so much more power and value in return the person, that, the person that's doing the purchasing. I'd, I'd echo that at 100%, and you can even increase that complexity by thinking about Amex, right? It's just it's a whole other game, to your point. That's a great point. I got a black card. I pay them $5,000 a year. American Express, Black Centurion. I pay them $5,000 a year to fuck over retailers for an extra percent, charging them 2.5% instead of 1.5%, and then I suck their balls and beg them to give me a little bit back in these stupid airline programs that I don't fucking it use. Exactly. Exactly. We pay our power bill with that. And that's exactly how that works. I mean, I know you've got a Litecoin bag. It's fine. But like, there's a lot of very affordable things. All the payment processors that let you well, use your Litecoin, the like, retailer. But Litecoin has the, the, the most volume at, in terms of transactions. Like out. No, but like I bought ten million dollars of watches with fucking not Litecoin, and I bought the world's largest diamond with not Litecoin, and I bought three million euros cool. of cars without Litecoin, and it's working really good because BitPay accepts all this shit. So BitPay accepts lots of stuff that ain't Litecoin. Yeah, what's the unique value of Litecoin? The same company that lets you accept Litecoin lets you accept all the other stuff too. And if you don't accept, if you're not using that company, then. They're all USD anyway. They're all just USD proxies. The, the retailer that sells you that shit's dumping whatever you gave him for fucking USD. He's not taking the volatility risk. Exactly. That's exactly it. So I'm trying to ask her, what is the what is the value proposition that is unique to Litecoin? What, what is your she owns it. Litecoin, rather? I know. I understand that. I'm trying to see if there's like some sort of like intrinsic well, it's reason. A, it's a user experience more, I think, I, I, and I don't want to, you know. But but I'm bomb, saying I'm saying like. The, it's like the time of Bitcoin supply, it's essentially the same thing. Right, right? but I'm saying, I'm saying it's like, it could be XYZ coin, it could be anything, right? Like, there's no difference there. It could be any other coin, insert coin here. I'm trying to figure out if there is a reason that it should be Litecoin, or if there is a reason that she has that I might, I might not be aware of why it is Litecoin. I mean, like, try to buy, 
like, all right, John Kimball a Lambo with Litecoin paid less than a cent for it. Try buying a Lambo with the ETH. Like, what is that going to be like? I bought a fucking Lambo with ETH. I did it. It worked fine. <laughs> what about the fees? <laughs> you don't care about fees. If you're willing to buy a JPEG for $20, right. fees, you don't right. care about Lambo. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's where you get into this discussion of what's 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 value worth to you. Value to me is in these other things are way higher than saving more than those percentages. So it's opinion based. And the reason why your, cheap, your fees are so cheap right now on Litecoin is because nobody's using it. Like it's a very, very that's low trend. Yeah. No, it is true. Like we can literally look at the charts and see the transaction that happen per day. It's roughly like sixty thousand transactions per day, which is like a third of, of Bitcoin, which is like which Bitcoin is a, like a fifth of uh, Ethereum. So it doesn't even I don't think it's even relevant to the sense of like this is a high usage chain. And, and we will make statements like no one's using it, and we know someone's using it. It's just in comparison to. I don't know. I think more research up, needs to be done on Litecoin. That's all I'm saying. What was that again? Repeat that. I think more research needs to be done, my friends. But no, I, like I've literally been in Litecoin since like the, the early days of Litecoin. Like I've done the research, and I'm telling you that it doesn't do anything special. Like it has lower block times for what? It has more coins for what? Like it doesn't do anything that's better than than, than any other Bitcoin derivative. I'm right, saying well, like just like the tire market, there's Michelin. There's, they all do the same thing, right? It's right, but I'm saying year. like she's. I'm oh. not selling. I'm saying it's being sold as a unique value prop. So I want to understand what the unique value prop is. But if there isn't one, then why are you buying it? Like right now, I'm telling you, BTC is dead. It's the same thing. BTC is dead right now because of its if it, because of its actual properties. Uh, like Litecoin is dead because it doesn't have any unique properties that are better than Ethereum, for example. Like you can't do the things you do on Ethereum that you can do on Litecoin. Like you don't have any any other way to economically spend your Litecoin rather than buying Hector. stuff using a Visa gift card. Like Look using a Visa Litecoin. card. No, no, but I'm saying like today, today, like you just said, the biggest use case right now is to go use a credit card that has that uses like BitPay to buy to transact your Litecoin to be able to view is to basically basically transfer a USD value over to the merchant because the merchant's not going to take your Litecoin. They're going to tr they're going to sell it right at the point of purchase. Hector, it's like the whole point of like my question at the start was just to say if you were to purchase something and what would be something that's cheap and feasible to do that with. All I'm saying is that Litecoin would be the coin yeah, I would use to do that. Ethereum, like, Ethereum to it's Ethereum cheap, is it's fast, it's easy. But the, it reason that, but the reason the reason you have those is you're not you're not the cheapest thing. Like thing. like Dogecoin is cheaper than you. Uh, Bitcoin well, Cash like, is cheaper Dogecoin than you. Dogecoin wouldn't be a thing without Litecoin. Like, what no, no, it, it, it doesn't. If I'm you saying, like Doge, you have to like Litecoin. No, but I'm saying like these are. I'm, I'm saying your, your unique selling proposition is that you're saying Hector. that it's cheap. BCH itself is cheaper. Like it's it's fractions of a cent. BSV is a fraction of a cent. So. Like those are much cheaper, and the reason that they're much cheaper, they have they both have higher uh, transactions. So when the fact that Litecoin goes up in transaction volume, like BTC goes up in transaction volume, your costs are going to go exponentially higher, which is going to defeat your own prop of being cheap. Which is in contrast to BCH and BSV. Where put, like for example, BSV had twenty had twenty million transactions in a twenty four hour period. Each transaction, average transaction cost was 0 0.001 cents. So. That still is a is a intact value prop at a very high throughput capacity, but, 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 which is but that, not that, the that, case. That same Hector. argument you're making, that same argument you're making, also applies with Ethereum, right? Guys, Ethereum the real now. risk here, the real risk here is not that you're paying X in fees; it's that you get fucking wrecked holding a bag of trash, right? Like Charlie Lee sold the top and dumped on you and abandoned his own fucking project and lied about integrating confidential transactions. Is just rather generally scummy, so. You know, it's a fee instead of a one cent fee. It's a, you're going to lose 99% of your fucking money holding a shit coin. I mean, that, that, that goes into the argument of, of intrinsic value, though. Like, you have to understand what the intrinsic value is. Like, I believe like, that's why I argue for Ethereum versus BTC that Ethereum has intrinsic value because there's economic things you can do with it, right? You, like, they may suck. They may not be the best things. They may not be, like, you know, the most pro. Let, let me give uh, an example. Let me give an example. I told you how to sell BCH for Bitcoin when it was 0.19. That, that it's now like, it dropped 99% is high, 0.5 was its high, but it dropped 99%. So while you're waiting for your low fees, you're losing all of your money sitting there before you do your transaction. You buy it, you're losing money. You hold it, you're losing money. The guy that takes it from you, he's losing money. Everyone feels bad for ever having touched it. No, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if, if you're if you're going to argue these things, like in the context of this this market, like, then you have to argue that these markets are highly efficient at, at price discovery, 
which these, make it, these markets are very highly inefficient, very highly illiquid compared to the traditional markets that there, it creates a high inefficiency. And also it's a very narrative driven uh, market. So no one actually knows what they're buying. Like right now, we just had someone talk to us about Litecoin and they're telling me to look into it when I looked into it when it barely came out. So um, that's that's where we're at. It's like it's not we're not in a very, very educated investor group is what I'm saying. Well, yeah, I agree with you that the price did go in that direction. Sure, that's fine, but that doesn't that doesn't speak on the merits that this market is very efficient in its sense. All right, um, we've been running out for a time. So, uh, I'm, I'm, Richard, do you have any closing closing thoughts? And I'll hand, hand it around for everyone. Get your free airdrop. Get your free airdrop. Play with your free coins, man. PulseChain.com, world's largest free airdrop. You know, you're tired of getting wrecked. Go play with your coins on a test net right now. Super easy. Hex.com, big dip, drop 90%. You know, things with product market fit, sometimes they don't drop much more than that. I think it dropped 95 total. Just stop. Just stop. Follow me.